Hello everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at clustering. So the first thing to really understand clustering, I think you should look at classification actually, so really get the idea of the difference between these two things. And so classification is this idea, you might be a little bit more familiar, uh, but essentially if I give you a bunch of data and I give you a label, and I think that's the key to really understand classification is it does have a label, or in other words, it's a supervised method. Um, and, and given that label, you know, you usually want to optimize some loss or some cost or some accuracy that, that is indicative of your performance on that. And so you have this given data, let's say we have these squares and they're either, you know, purple or, or orange. Um, and these can be like images or words or I mean really anything um, because we just want to make some model this error or essentially right. We want to make this model that actually can predict what the class is based on um, these, you know, the given data set. And so given this data, we want to actually determine the label. Um, so we actually in contrast, so when we do clustering, we're actually not given a label. So we're just given a mixture of points. And what we say is, okay, given this point, um, given the data, we want to essentially determine the distance to each of the other data points or some, some summary measure like a mean or something of some other data points. And this will actually like let us tell essentially the relative position. I think this idea of this distance is uh, very key. And there's a lot of different ways that they define this distance. And we'll go into a couple of specific ways in a second. Um, but essentially, that's a very uh, similar thing that happens in a lot of clustering algorithms. Essentially, this distance is used to, uh, you know, to have this data. And it's actually used to, to you know, um, determine groups of data points based on their relative distance to each other. And so one of the, the I'm going to go more into the advantages and disadvantages of clustering, but uh, one thing I will say is that it's kind of really hard to really evaluate how good your clustering is. So the, I mean, in contrast, the whole idea of classification was this idea that we were trying to classify something and get some uh, given tangible output. Um, and for clustering, we're essentially just seeing how the, the points group together. And so it's really kind of, it really is just what you get. Like that's that cluster is just what the cluster says. Um, it's a lot harder to really evaluate these. Um, and I will say like something like sometimes I've noticed in biology data is that essentially um, like if you have a given, you know, a bunch of, of different data points from different species, it's going to detect pretty much just the most variance or in other words, just the species effect. And so that's why you see a lot of times you'll see PCAs or something like that. And people will try to make clusters and essentially always will just be the species effect. Um, and so it really is kind of hard to kind of tune it in a way um, to really get the question that you want if your if your variance is not really what you're testing. If the most if the, uh, if the kind of features that have the most variance aren't actually what you're interested in. Um, but anyways, this idea, if you just remember this idea that if, if your, your algorithm is defining some distance relative to the other data points, um, that's pretty indicative that you're doing some kind of clustering algorithm. So we're going to go into a little bit more of the advantages and disadvantages now. So some of the advantages of clustering data is actually, it, it's really nice because it kind of works for really any kind of data. You can do this for images, you can do this for plots, you can do this for, for graphs, you can do this for, um, you know, given uh, words. Uh, they always make really kind of nice plots and figures that you can kind of show to people and, and they can really kind of make the case. Um, and they are, you know, kind of speaking with that, they are tend to be more interpretable because you're able to kind of identify points and kind of use your own reasoning to identify, you know, why these clusters are existent, existing this way. Um, this, this advantage, this advantage is, um, so they are, again, like I was saying, very sensitive to this variance. And the other thing is, I, the reason I mean, in my element, I, in my actual work, I haven't actually used clustering uh, a lot, you know, and, and even in the context of where I have used it, it's mainly just been for data visualization. Um, and so it's really, because it's really kind of hard to think of a problem that wouldn't be more suited to like a classification test like anything that's in the quote real world like if you're trying to figure out the effect of a drug if you're trying to figure out how to make uh op optimize this you know um you know shipping line or something like that if you're trying to do you know, this actual task um you can imagine that clustering isn't really you know very practical enough to move on but again it does provide some interpretability and some nice uh you know plots and figures which can really help sell some of the, re the previous research that you've done with other methods um, so that's definitely something to consider when you are looking at actually using cluster in your own work so next i'm going to talk about two different methods of, of clustering these are most uh, clustering algorithms probably fall into one of these two categories um, and so this partitioning, you know, you start with this big data set and you want to split it into K subclasses. Um, and so, you know, a very, you know, simple question is, well, what is K? And that kind of just depends on your data set. And this is kind of where it gets into 
uh, difficult to determine what the optimal um, you know clustering, how to how to improve your clustering. You can do things like um, AIC or BIC, which will essentially you know use it's essentially comp like uh, penalizing complexity of your model. Essentially, you're trying to explain most of the variance or most of the clustering of your model with the fewest amount of subclasses. A sort of idea, of sort of similar to regularization. Um, and there are ways to do that, but even then, it's still kind of uh, it, it's just because it really, again, when you try to really apply this sort of these kind of clustering algorithms, it's kind of hard to figure out what exactly, how exactly you're going to grade these. And so determining that number of clusters K tends to kind of be an issue that, you know, is, is very subjective and can be uh, very different. Um, and sometimes you might have a reason, a prior reason to say, well, I think that there should be three clusters. And usually that is usually the way to go. Um, if you do have that sort of information, but if not, um, you know, it might be not something that that as be useful. So you could use um, something like hierarchical clustering as well. And this essentially is uh, similar, except you kind of, you split the data set, you're starting with the data set, you keep on splitting that into smaller and smaller subsets until you get to some minimum distance and where you stop calling it. Uh, or so you get, until you get to each subset size of one. And essentially you will, at the end of the day, you'll have everything will be in its own class. And then as you go back upwards, you try to figure out what determines the distance threshold for that determines what is a cluster are these two clustered together or are they not um, and so you can kind of use that to kind of use this to see that you can uh, this is how they construct phylogenetic trees and we'll get into that more in a second so the first clustering method that we're going to talk about in detail is k-means and so this distance that they're using is the Euclidean distance. Um, and so the idea is that you have some initial guess. So you say, well, let's just assume for this one, we use uh, K equals two. Uh, we have our data, you see, we just have unlabeled data points, uh, but we're gonna have two centroids. We're gonna randomly place those centroids. And then what we do is we label everything within some that's closer to this one, to the yellow versus this red. Uh, we label everything like that. Um, so all these will be yellow. And then only these two are close to the original red. And then what we do is we actually move the centroids and then we move these these distances the initial guesses to wherever the mean of the of all, of all the yellow points are essentially and then we redo that we re recalculate the distances to the nearest points we do this until it converges and it'll converge to something like this or something um, and so this idea is again you initially guess it and you use a distance just a, a simple euclidean distance you know uh distance formula between a given point you can do this obviously in, in you know in dimensional space with this is how they kind of the same way that they do this with word vectors and stuff like that uh but this idea that that you you can reiterate this and keep on um, moving your centroids and your guesses in order to, to the mean of what your previous guesses are and able and able to, in order to get convergence and you actually find out what your final clusters are. So another sort of way that people do look at, at this sort of distance is, is the number of differences or this edit distance. So you're given some string, um, you know, you have some reference string. What's the what's the number of distance of changes that I have to make to this uh, string of DNA in order to get this original string? And then you can use that to say, well, you know, it's more probable that this least common ancestor uh, will have the least amount of edits to all of the subclasses, right? So you can use this to sort of uh, do these phylogenetic trees and you end up getting something like this. And again, remember that we said that in this hierarchical clustering method all of these will essentially just be in their own class at the end of the day and so these are common uh, common ways that they have been used to use uh, clustering algorithms finally we're just going to look at this uh, what's called db scan or density based spatial clustering applications with noise and it's essentially this idea that um, you know, we, this is kind of a figure from the original 1996 paper, and they're essentially showing that that you can kind of understand what a cluster is based on sort of the density of the points, and you can kind of understand what the what these are noise. So their their kind of motivation is well, you could have some cluster that's like very elongated like this, um, and obviously you can see how something like k-means uh, wouldn't necessarily work as well for this. Um, you see sort some sort of similar things, and so essentially they define um, you know this minimum. Uh, this minimum parameters that would allow us to detect that what they would consider the thinnest cluster. Um, and then they use these dense points, the density of these points to actually find uh, what points are clusters and which points are actually outliers. And so in this algorithm, some of these points will actually just be considered outliers, uh, which is helpful because I think like, in, if you think about other k-mean um, algorithms, you know, every single point is necessarily labeled, but there might be some benefit in actually not, um, you know, labeling every single point, maybe having some that are just noise. Um, and then, so finally, um, they, they actually, you know, they, they, people, a lot of people use this sort of method because it's, it tends to be very efficient. You can do this with very large data sets. Uh, so something definitely interested to check out if you are doing a little bit more uh, clustering work.
everyone thank you so much for joining i thank you so much for watching uh, if you can help me out with that like and subscribe you can help me cluster so that youtube will actually have their clustering algorithms look at my data and be able to say what kind of other other uh videos that other people would like so they can actually suggest them you can actually help uh, label these points and, and let youtube actually have this sort of a uh, very nice algorithm that helps me out and if you learn anything please feel free to leave a comment in the description again um, really appreciate you watching thanks bye